These questions all involve heat energy being transferred from one substance to another substance. So the important rule we're going to be using in this question is that the heat released by one substance is going to have to equal the heat gained by one substance. So the heat's being transferred from one place to another. Let's have a look and read this question. So in this question we have two different substances. Sample one is water and has a mass of 19 grams and initial temperature of 10 degrees C. Substance two is a cube made of iron. It has a mass of 19 grams, again, and initial temperature of 30 degrees C. So we can see the iron cube has a higher temperature than the water. We're also told liquid water has a specific heat capacity of 4.19 joules per gram degree C, and solid iron has a specific heat capacity of 0 0.450 joules per gram degree C. So the iron has a lower specific heat capacity than the water. We're then told that the student pours both samples into a polystyrene cup calorimeter that's shown down here and waits for the mixture to reach thermal equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium, what that means is that we have two substances with different temperatures. When we mix them together, their temperatures are going to change until they have the same temperature as each other. So whatever has a higher temperature is going to cool down and whatever has a lower temperature is going to warm up until they have the same temperature as each other. So in this case, sample two has a higher temperature and sample one has a lower temperature. So this is going to cool down and this is going to warm up until they reach a thermal equilibrium where they have the same temperature as each other. In that process, the heat absorbed by the water as it warms up, that's all supplied from that iron cube. So the heat absorbed from the water is going to be equal to the heat released by the iron cube. So that's what we're going to use to figure out the final temperature. We're going to be setting the heat absorbed for the water equal to the heat released for the iron. So first let's go through and fill out our known variables. The mass of both substances is 19 grams, so we can go ahead and fill that out now. We're told in the question the specific heat capacity of water is 4.19 joules per gram degree C. And for iron, it's 0 0.45 joules per gram degree C. We don't know the change in temperature yet, but we do know our initial temperature for each. So I'm just going to underline those in the question. Let's call the initial temperature for water T1. That's 10 degrees C. And then for sample two, we know the initial temperature was 30 degrees C. I'm going to call that T2. So that's going to be 30 degrees C. And these are going to be reaching a final temperature that is the same for both. So I'm going to add that here. I'm going to call it TF. Both of them are going to have the same TF. That's why I've used the same symbol for those. That's our final temperature of each of those. Okay, so we know the initial, but we don't know the change in temperature and we don't know the final temperature. We also don't know the heat energy absorbed or released by either of them during this process. So it looks like we have a few unknowns. Let's go to the reference sheet and find our equation. In this question, we have things changing temperature. So that's telling us we're looking at the specific heat equation, which is Q equals MC delta T. So right now, it seems like we have too many unknowns. However, there's one other thing we can use, which is that we know our heat absorbed by the water is going to be equal to the heat released by the iron. So we know that Q1 is going to be equal to Q2 in magnitude. They're going to have the same size. So setting the specific heat equation equal for both of our substances. So that would give us M1 times C1 times delta T1 is equal to 
M2, C2, delta T2. Okay, now we know the masses and we know the C, the specific heat capacities. For the delta T, we don't know the change in temperature of each, but we do know the initial temperature for both and we know the final temperature is gonna be the same. So if we plug in our equation for delta T for each of those, we should be able to use that to find an equation that just has one unknown variable, that would be Tf. So let's do that over here. So delta T1, if we wanted to find the change in temperature for sample one, and remember those lines mean the absolute value or the magnitude, so we're just looking for a positive number right now. So to get that, we know we're starting at 10 degrees C, which is T1, we're ending at Tf. So our change in temperature is gonna be T final minus T1. And that's gonna give us a positive number because Tf is bigger than T1, because it's warming up. So that's gonna give us our magnitude of the change in temperature one. For sample two, delta T2, this time, we know we start at 30 degrees and we end at a lower temperature at Tf. So we want to find the difference between T2 and Tf, but this time, since we're cooling down, our initial temperature is higher than our final temperature. So I'm going to do the initial temperature, which was T2, that's for sample 2, minus the final temperature. So that equation there gives us our magnitude of the change in T2. So all we need to do now is substitute these into our equation over here. So it's going to be M1 times C1 times Tf minus T1. And then on the right hand side, M2 times C2 times T2 minus Tf. Okay, so now if we look through our equation, Everything in here is a known value except for Tf. Tf is our only unknown variable in this equation. That means we can rearrange and solve for Tf and plug in our numbers and we'll be able to calculate Tf. So it's going to be a bit of a long process, but let's go ahead and rearrange our equation for Tf. So first I'm going to multiply out my brackets on both sides of my equation. So I've got M1 times C1 times Tf minus M1 times C1 times T1 on the left. And then on the right, I've got M2 times C2 times T2 minus M2 times C2 times Tf. Okay, so I want to get anything with Tf in it onto the left hand side of my equation. Anything else that doesn't have Tf, I want to get that onto my right side of the equation. So I'm going to be adding M2C2 times Tf to both sides. And I'm going to be adding M1C1 T1 to both sides. That's going to give me M1C1 Tf plus M2 C2 Tf. On the right, we're going to have M2 C2 T2 plus M1 C1 T1. And that's because we added this to both sides. And we added this to both sides. And this cancelled here, and this cancelled here. That's how we end up with that equation. Okay, lastly, we need to uh, rearrange this to get Tf as the subject. So I can see I've got Tf in both of my terms on the left side. So I'm going to take Tf out. So I've got Tf multiplied by m1 times c1 plus m2 times c2. My right hand side, we don't need to do anything to that because it doesn't have our tf in it, so we can just leave that as it is. 
Finally, to get TF on its own, all we need to do is divide by M1, C1, plus M2, C2 on both sides. And that's going to cancel on the left. Awesome, we're nearly done. So that leaves us with TF is equal to M2 times C2 times T2 plus M1 times C1 times T1 divided by M1 times C1 plus M2 times C2. Oh, that was a lot of algebra, but we've done it. We've got an expression for TF. So we can go ahead now and put in our numbers. So for TF, the mass of sample 2 is 19 grams, multiplied by C, the specific heat capacity of sample 2, which is 0 0.45, multiplied by the temperature of sample 2, which is 30. Plus M1, that's also 19. C1, that's 4.19. T1, that's 10. We're going to divide that by M1, which was... 19 multiplied by C1, which was 4.19, plus M2, which is also 19, multiplied by C2, which is 0 0.45. We're going to put that all into our calculator. When we do, we get out a final temperature TF of 11.9 degrees C. Phew, that was a lot of algebra. What we've done it, we got through to our answer. So we've already found here TF, the final temperature, that was the same for both of our samples. I can fill that in here. We got 11.9 degrees C. And that's actually the final question we're looking for here. We're looking for the final temperature and we got that here. It's 11.9 degrees C. And just as a recap, the way we did that was we set the heat absorbed by one sample equal to the heat released by the other sample we got expressions for the change in temperature for each substance using TF, the final temperature, which is the same for both, and then T1 and T2, which were the initial temperature of each. And then we rearranged our equation for TF and solved. So we've done the difficult part. Finally, now all we need to do is find the change in temperature and the energy absorbed or released for each of our substances. Now notice in this question, we don't have those lines, those absolute value lines on our answers here. So we are going to need to use a positive number for an increase and a negative number for a decrease. We can now just put our numbers for TF and T1 and T2 into our equations over here for the change in temperature for each sample. So for sample one, the magnitude of the change in temperature is going to be TF, which is 11.9 minus T1, which was 10, that gets us 1.9 degrees C as our change. When we go ahead and put that in here, it's going to need to be a positive number because we're increasing our temperature from 10 to 11.9. So that's going to be a positive number, 1.9 degrees C. I'll just write that here as well. So our T1 was positive 1.9 degrees C. Now for sample 2, the magnitude of the change in temperature for sample 2 is going to be T2, the initial temperature of sample 2, which was 30, minus Tf, the final temperature of the mixture, which was 11.9. That gets us a change in temperature for sample 2 of 18.1 degrees C. And this was a decrease in temperature. We started at 30 degrees, we're ending up at 11.9. So when we want to find just the change in temperature for sample two without those lines, meaning not just the absolute value. This is a decrease, so it's going to need a negative sign, negative 18.1 degrees C. So we can go ahead and fill that in here. And then lastly, we need to calculate the heat absorbed and released by each of our samples. So let's go ahead and do that for Q1 first, we're using this equation MC delta T. So the mass is 19, C is 4.19, and the magnitude of the temperature change was 1.9. That gets us out of value for the magnitude of heat 
change in sample one of 154 joules. And since sample one increased in temperature, it absorbed heat. That means this is going to be positive. So our Q1 without those lines is still going to be 154 joules because it's positive. You can go ahead and fill that out now. And then lastly, let's do the same thing for sample two. Our change in energy for sample two is going to be the mass of sample two, which was 19 multiplied by the heat capacity for sample two, which is 0 0.45 multiplied by the magnitude of our change in temperature was 18.1. We put that in our, to our calculator. We're going to get out again 154 joules. That makes sense because this was the basis of our whole argument was that the heat absorbed by one is going to equal the heat released by the other. However, when we're getting our value without those lines, so not the absolute value, we want the value with a positive or negative sign. Since this was a decrease in heat, the heat was released or given out, it's going to be negative 154 joules. So we can go fill that in our answer box here now. Wow, okay. So there's a lot going on in this question. Firstly, we're setting our heat absorbed and heat released equal. That's what's happening here. We're setting our specific heat equation equal for our two substances, substituting in uh, an equation for delta T for each one, and then solving that to find our TF, our final temperature. Finally, we can substitute that final temperature back into our equations for the temperature change and for the heat or energy change for each of our substances.